This is it, folks. Come along for the ride. It will be my last year next year, and it will be known as a fan appreciation tour. Seven-time Winston Cup champion, King Richard Petty. Now, you may not follow the NBA. You've heard of the Boston Celtics. You might not be an NFL fan. You've heard of the Green Bay Packers. You may not be a racing fan. You've heard of Richard Petty. Richard Petty. He's a hero in my eyes, and he's a hero in, in those people that stand in that line to get that autograph. We love you, Richard! We love you! Well, I can't say one word of bad about Richard Petty, and I don't think nobody else can. It's July, and Richard Petty's in Daytona for his final appearance as a driver. He had an outstanding qualifying run that looked like it would put him on the pole. But Sterling Marlin came along near the end of the day, and by a fraction of a second, knocked the king out of the starting position. Dad gummit, Richard. I sure am sorry I won that pole. Richard wound up on the outside pole. His first time on the front row since 1986. Fans were elated to have the number 43 at the head of the pack. And later that same day, turned out by the thousands to congratulate the king and wish him a happy 55th birthday. King Richard, happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. The public party was the beginning of a weekend full of birthday celebrations, accolades, and honors. Let's unveil the Richard Petty bus from Votran here in Daytona Beach, Florida. The Daytona Beach City Council unveiled a city bus painted like the Petty Pontiac. The designated route for the bus, Richard Petty Boulevard. Today is Independence Day. It's Richard Petty's last race at Daytona. And in attendance, the President of the United States. Richard Petty, the President, the 4th of July, Daytona. It was deja vu. In 1984, this combination made for a red letter date in racing. Gentlemen, start your engines. Richard Petty has been to the White House many times. But Ronald Reagan was the first president ever to attend a NASCAR race. From the press box, he watched as Richard Petty and Cale Yarborough fought for the lead. This is an interesting rule situation, Jim. You are allowed to race to the line once the yellow has come out. Cale Yarborough did that. Richard Petty is counterattacking. This may be the race that we're looking at here as they sweep up into traffic. A highly dangerous situation. These Coming the down the front runners. straight. Here they are, Sam. They will come across the yellow line just about together, but Petty had the lead. By the nose of the car, Richard Petty was just in front of Cale Yarbrough as they came across the line. Now With three laps remaining, the race would end under caution. Richard Petty has won the 200th race of his incomparable Grand National Stock Car Racing career. 
200 wins, a remarkable and believed to be untouchable record. And that magic number 200 came under very special conditions. You know, 200 is, is very, very important, but uh, under the circumstances, uh, with all the presidents that's ever been in the United States, this is the first one that's ever showed up at a racetrack. So everybody's got to go from that, from racing standpoint. And I wanted to be the one that was able to, to welcome him to Grand National Race. Uh, then after that was over, uh, we went down and and uh, had a little get together and everybody sit down and eat their fried chicken together and you know you sit right there with the president and just talk every day's stuff uh you know th those people are human too i mean they just got a different job to do than we do for the very last time in a driver's uniform here in daytona the man the legend the king richard petty During the pre-race ceremony, Richard was showered with gifts and honored by President George Bush. You know, there's not many people that the President of the United States introduces. It's usually the other way around, so uh, you know, it makes you feel about this big to be able to do it. But in a long time, it makes you feel real big, too. Gentlemen, start your engines. on hand, looking on. Green flag goes in the air, and they are underway in the pits of water as Richard Petty takes the green flag for his final start in this afternoon. Door to door, they cross the line and head to turn one. Richard Petty has the lead going into turn one. He's got it so far. Who is going to have the lead? They're side by side as they come down. Richard Petty is going to lead it. That's magic, man. It really made you feel good to look out in the front and there wasn't nobody in front of you and everybody's behind you like what you think they're supposed to be or like what they used to be. With on-track temperatures exceeding 130 degrees, the heat became a factor for the king early in the race. You have to get a driver, Robbie. I don't know what you can do. Listen to me now, Richard. For a Bad just bring that thing in, but don't take no chance. They found Eddie Beerswell. Eddie's also had his problems with the heat, though, today as Richard pulls the SDP Pontiac into his pit lane. The King climbs out of the car very, very hot. The relief driver tried to keep the STP Pontiac in competition, but Beerswell's 5'10 frame didn't fit the seat that's custom designed to fit a 6'2 Richard Petty. Now, you're too much of a gentleman to say, but uh, you were in that driver's suit for about two and a half hours longer this morning than any of the drivers in that, in that uh, Nomex underwear in the driver's suit. And this heat, that's going to take its toll. Well, it didn't help anything. I think that plus just uh, the mental deal of being at Daytona, trying to do as good as we could, uh, you know, the president being here, I was all excited about all that stuff. And I think I just like a kid with a new toy. I think I got too, uh, too hepped up about everything and wasn't laid back quite enough. Once Richard made it to the cool quiet of his bus, he could have easily stayed there, but instead, he came out to greet what started out as a small group of fans. I think he felt like he owed it to those people. Uh, they had been to the race, and of course, they wanted to meet him, and they wanted to, uh, he, they, want, they had something special that they wanted signed. I mean, here's 15 or 20 people. I don't think we really thought, well, you know, a hundred more is gonna come from somewhere else. All at once, there they were. Fatigue didn't keep Richard Petty down for long. The next day, he climbed right back in the car. What's the car doing here, bud? Man, I don't know. Right now, it's okay. That speed is pretty good. Watch your Richard coming on forward. Watch out. Slow down, bud. Slow down. Slow down. Slow down, Richard. Watch behind you. Watch behind you. Oh, Lord, <laughs> After Daytona, the Petties spent a few days at Disney World in Orlando, where Richard was the featured celebrity at the MGM Studios theme park. Richard, 
this has been the highlight of, of the whole tour, really, uh, for me and the family. Uh, you know, I sort of come along so that they could come along, but I think I've enjoyed it more than the family's enjoyed it. You are my favorite race car driver. I'll never forget you. Richard Petty has a legion of dedicated fans. One way he shows his appreciation for them is with an open house every four years. The first was in 1968, the most recent in 1988. This year's happened to coincide with the 1992 Fan Appreciation Tour. Somebody got a face. He's famous. I mean, he's, you know, he's one of a kind. On a hot July weekend, nearly 40,000 people converge on Level Cross for a rare look at Richard's race shop and to get his autograph. We've been in line almost six hours. Waiting for autograph, it's almost six hours now. Right now, I would say I wouldn't stand in line for anybody, for anything, for that long. I, you know, if I was waiting on a paycheck, I'd been, I believe I'd come back the next day. I believe that'd just be too long just to stand in line for anything. Artistically, he's got one of the most recognizable and, and fully developed autographs you've ever seen. There's so many little circles, and, and it just takes him a long, long time to sign it. That's it right there, guys. The Richard Petty signature is a prized possession, and fans will go to any length to get it. When I was first started going to the races, I'd see it. And I said, that's my man right there. And I said, if I could touch that man one time, I'd die as a happy woman. But now I'm 65 years old, and I'm finally going to get to see <laughs> Petty, Petty. That brainwashed him, too, right? Some even show up unannounced at his home. You have to learn it, to be a wife. You've got to learn that, you know, you are married to somebody, and he is, he is a public figure. Uh, we know that these are the people that have supported us and they've been good to us and uh, they bought the tickets and they've paid the bills. So therefore, you know, I can't say, well, I don't want you coming around bothering my husband because, you know, this is a fan. And um, so I just know that that's part of how it is and I just learned to accept it. It was a pure, petty weekend in Pocono. Richard was treated like royalty, and to top it off, had a great qualifying run. He drove the car to the seventh starting position. He finished the race in 20th. But the story of the day belonged to Davey Allison. Oh, he is. Oh, and he's upside down. Into the guardrail, side over side, end over end, and Davey Allison has experienced a horrifying crash. Oh. Robbie, I don't know what happened over there, but it's just all going down through there, and, and uh, Davey got backwards and started flying. He went pretty high. He went hard, concrete and all that stuff. But what we need to do is uh, concentrate on the race. But... The crash looked devastating, and Davey was hurt. He broke his forearm and collarbone and dislocated his wrist, but he survived. The Winston Cup cars are designed to withstand the worst of impacts. Over the years, some critical safety measures have been developed by Petty Enterprises. Over the top of the guardrail. This bar right here was named the Petty Bar by Richard because he wanted to protect his head. It, it, when they first started putting this bar in, it went from the left bottom to the right top. He said, let's put it from the right bottom to the left top to protect my head. In here, we hook our seats a little bit different. Most of the car builders hook the seat bracket to this crossover bar here, but Richard's like his seat to be hooked to this bar right here, so if he gets a, a lick here, supposedly these bars will carry his seat with him that way as the car gives. We had a violent crash in 70 at Darlington where Richard's head and arm and everything got out the window, so we, we came up with a window screen, which was metal mesh, and we've revived it down. We've been with this for several years now, which is a, a window net. It's fireproof. Petty has always been an innovator. He was one of the first drivers to discover the art of drafting. He found on super speedways that he could use the vacuum created by the lead car as a tow, and by doing so, save fuel and cut down on engine wear. That could have something to do with his record number of 55 super speedway wins. Petty Enterprises has also been a training ground for many racing novices. Uh, when I look around and see the, the people that have come through here, it, it, it makes me feel real proud. 
you know, you can't you can't take many steps in the pit if you don't see somebody that's been through here that's that's fairly successful. He's a great teacher. I mean, he's a class act, and uh, even though it was a uh, some years back, I think I learned more about preparation of a race car and uh, organizing a race team uh, from Richard Petty and Dale Inman both. And as far as, as getting on the right road to winning a championship. A lot of times you'll see young guys like myself or, or Brett Bodine, Sterling Marlin, some of the younger guys might have old Rich cornered and, and saying, you know, what do we do now? We're, 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 we need some advice and there's, there's not a better place to go to get it. Hey, yo, Mikey. Rich. Michael Waltrip didn't only work for Petty Enterprises, he lived with Richard and Linda for almost a year. What I like the most about Richard Petty after I got finished living there is that the person that all these race fans love so much and have so much respect for, he's the same dude when he's sitting on his couch in his living room as, as they see. You know, he's, he doesn't put on a show or he doesn't do anything for the fans, it's just Richard. He's got the longest finger I ever saw and it's crooked. It, it's twice as long as mine, but it's crooked. You ever know, if you ever, I think it's from poking people in the chest is what I think it's from, but it runs way out there. It kind of looks like E.T.'s finger when he's saying he wants to phone home. When you see that finger pointing in your face, you know you have made a bad, bad mistake. Today's racing requires deep pockets. The car hauler alone costs $250,000 carrying two cars, a spare engine, and other equipment. The hauler and its contents are worth well over half a million dollars. For the man in charge of this high-dollar 18-wheeler, the 29 race Winston Cup season is a constant blur of life on the road. Today's seven-hour trip to Talladega is a cakewalk. The toughest run of the year is the 2,800-mile, 52-hour drive each way to Sonoma, California. I always wanted to drive a, a transporter for a Winston Cup race team, but I never did. Really, in my wildest dreams, I think I'd ever wind up driving this one. Race weekend starts early for Winston Cup transporters. Are you uh, all set to come in? They have to be at the track early Thursday morning. This weekend got off to an exciting start with Richard qualifying fourth. And on race day, Vice President Dan Quayle stopped in to wish him well. Okay, buddy. The crew was concerned about one thing, the heat. You know, we had a lot of negative things down at, uh, at Daytona, and we're trying to not let that happen here. We've, we've double-checked a lot of different things, and they've had me in a cool place trying to, trying to make me last at least a little bit longer. Part of the race day routine includes preparing Richard's ever-present orange juice. And it works best only with the <clears throat> fresh squeezed juice because it gets all the pulp and everything in there, which helps with the, the nutrients and whatever. And the idea is that it keeps his fluid level up so that he doesn't get dehydrated during the race. Once the green flag drops, where in the world is Linda Petty? She's not in the stands. She's not in the pits. But she's there, all right. She's in their bus, and you can bet she's watching the race. She's got a husband and son out there. Kyle's in this pack right here. Today's national television broadcast features a petty memory, a look back at one of Petty's most celebrated moments. He was moments. trying to kiss him. Now watch him. See him, watch him. Richard was trying to get away from him. This is the Victory Lane celebration of Richard Petty's 1973 Daytona 500 win. The exuberant fellow is Andy Granatelli. He was the president of STP, and this was Richard's first Daytona 500 win with STP as his sponsor. Granatelli, this year in Talladega, was inducted into the International Motorsports Hall of Fame. Please welcome my friend, Andy Granatelli. Andy Granatelli, STP, and Richard Petty, it was a relationship that was really made in heaven. I mean, it was just unbelievable. I mean, he became our number one salesman almost immediately and all. If you don't like the looks of your car, 
Shoot it. We son of a gun protect it from STP. And you go back to just the last few years to the uh, son of a gun commercials, and once Richard began doing that, the, their share of the market went from, if I recall correctly, 2% to 18%. The 21-year relationship between Richard Petty and STP is the longest standing between a driver and a sponsor. It all began in 1971. I presented my program to him, and at the time I had a real nice uh, high school trophy jacket on, you know, with leather sleeves and uh, a red, uh, a red uh, cloth in front of me and so forth, now with nice buttons and everything. And they listened to my program and they were very, very courteous and all. And uh, just out of the clear blue sky, uh, Richard says, I'll tell you what we're gonna do. He says, uh, if you give us one of those jackets, he says, we'll sign with you and all. When car manufacturers began to back out of auto racing in the late 60s, and, uh, sponsors became a necessity. Does, Today, certain... they are the bread and butter of the sport and Richard paved the way. The number of products associated with Richard Petty is phenomenal. The food products alone that bear his name. Hot dogs, ice cream, barbecue sauce, country ham, even cornflakes. And he's been a spokesman for an endless number of products and causes. One way to earn even more money with Reynolds Recycling is to flatten your aluminum cans before you bring them in. Give me a break. How's that, Mick? I mean, 76 may be the biggest name in racing, but dig this guy who thinks he's Richard Petty. But, officer, I was just running the speed limit. Yeah, I know. I want a ticket. Sorry, buddy. You got to get your ticket at the local Pontiac dealer. Here's the Petty Blue Rider from Dynamark with an 8-horsepower Briggs & Stratton engine and a 32-inch cut. I bought the Big Blue, and I've used it for years. You have to hang on in the dangerous high bank curve, and you can with your incredible magnet traction car. Parents, take it from me. The closest thing to real racing is AFX from Aurora. The advertising has had an impact, like the time Richard and Ed Parks went down to Dawsonville, Georgia, to visit the Elliots. We'd enjoyed our meal and all, and we were about ready to leave. And I noticed an older couple that had just wandered in back there. And the lady walked up to Dan, and she says, are you Bill Elliott? He said, no, ma'am. said, I'm Dan. said, I'm Bill's brother. So the fellow walked over to Richard, and he says, aren't you somebody famous? He said, no. He said, I'm not famous. He said, mister, said, I've seen you on TV. He said, you're the man that's had a thousand headaches. So Richard immediately reached in his pocket, pulled out several goodies and gave it to the man and he thanked him and the man walked out. To think that it all started 21 years ago with STP and number 43, how fitting that Richard would be the one to honor Granatelli. I finally got him to kiss me. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at Talladega, the strategy to beat the heat was working. Richard keeps that towel, he keeps that thing iced down, and when this set of pit stops comes up, they'll throw, he'll throw that towel out the window, and they'll give him another one that's been soaking in ice water. He keeps in his mouth all day. The King finished the race. He had one of his two best finishes of the year. Both 15th, and both came at Talladega. It's time for the crew to load up and head back home to get set for Watkins Glen. Well, we all got up about 5.30 this morning to come out to the racetrack. We got at the racetrack about 6.30. Race started at 1. It was hot as all get out. <laughs> and we wound up finishing 15th, which is not good, but not bad either. And now we're looking at about a seven-hour trip home to North Carolina. Yeah, it's all part of being a Winston Cup truck driver. Fans at Watkins Glen in New York went crazy over Richard Petty.
Race day was plagued by sporadic downpours. Eventually, the red flag came out just past the halfway mark. But when the race ended, no amount of rain could dampen enthusiasm for the winner. There was a petty in victory circle. Kyle had taken his first win of the season. Fanfare for the King was a pre-race theme as he made his way through the second half of the season. At Michigan, he was honored with a Lifetime Achievement Award and again showered with gifts. Robbie Loomis told me the crew chief that you got to watch us on Sunday. He said we have a brand new race car for Michigan. And on top of the new race car, our engine man, Bob Ripple, who they've nicknamed Mr. Torque, has put one dynamite motor. So we're going to be a factor if we can stay out there all afternoon. Richard's crew puts in countless hours preparing for races. They practice relentlessly to shave a fraction of a second off their pit stops. Gas is pouring in from 10-gallon cans while Richard sits there calm as you please. Just think, at one time, a 42-second pit stop was impressive. Go! Four tires and 20 gallons of gas in 42 seconds. I bet you fellas forgot to give them trading stamps. Now, 22 seconds is an average pit stop. That doesn't happen without lots of practice. All the hard work doesn't go unnoticed by Richard Petty, and loyalty at Petty Enterprises goes both ways. You could have been responsible for losing the, the last chance he had to win the Daytona 500. And if it was an honest mistake, I mean, he may go off in the corner and scream, but he never never jumped down your throat, and, he, and even if he was, he. And if he, they call you off to the side, they'd never, they'd never try to humiliate you in front of a bunch of people. I mean, that just, just doesn't happen. Some crew members are weekend warriors. They're volunteers like Frank Anderson and David Johns, people who help out on race weekend for no pay. It's changed my whole life, uh, being around Richard, seeing how he conducts himself, seeing how he wants people around him to be. Uh, you know, everybody is looking for an idol or a hero, and Richard came in my life just at the time that I needed a hero. Got your card ready? In Bristol, Tennessee, the final countdown begins. Ten races to go. This weekend, grandson Austin was the Grand Marshal. Here, Richard continued his affinity for the 16th spot. The team went from Bristol on to Darlington, where weather again would be a factor. The temperature, 81 degrees, 80% humidity. It is hot and muggy here on Labor Day weekend in Darlington, and there is a 70% chance of rain. Just past the halfway mark, the rain began to make its way over the racetrack. Coming across, uh, coming across turn two here in a minute, Richard. Just hang on to it. Hang on to it. It's going to be raining here in about two or three laps. The engine on number 43 was overheating, so the showers offered a welcome cool down. But once the rain started, it didn't stop. And the race ended under the red flag. Overall, an uneventful race for the king. I'll come back and get it. 70,000 people. A record crowd for a Virginia sporting event showed up in Richmond to bid farewell to the king. Richard was just honored by the winner of the National Spelling Bee, who's from Henrico County, Virginia. Her name is Amanda Go, and she just was asked how to spell Richard Petty. She said T-H-E-K-I-N-G. The cool fall evening made it difficult to set up the cars, but the petty crew dialed it in. Hang tough, where you at? Hang tough. And came away pleased with their performance. It's all over. Did a good job there, driver. What are we running? 16th? Yeah. 16th. Where else? For the fifth time this year, they finished in the 16th spot. All right. <laughs> 
run good. We run good and run bad, but still run 16. Right? I tell you, really, it doesn't matter to me. Okay, uh, you know, I'd like to run first and I'd like to run 10th or whatever, <laughs> but uh, if I can run all day and stay out of everybody's way and, and not tear up nothing and run 16th, then, you know, from my standpoint, I'm just trying to get through everything and, and have something at the end, of the end of the day or the end of the year. Richmond is a track that when it has been good to the king, it has been very good. And when it has been bad, it's been the worst. It was here in 1989 that for the first time in his career, he didn't qualify for a race. I think I cried uh, every mile of the way from Richmond back to Level Cross because uh, I knew how devastated that he was. I remember we all just said, okay, let's just keep him busy because he came out and he sat in his chair and he was really quiet. But we brought our kids and we started, you know, getting really excited and just <clears throat> involving him in, in the family part of it. And I think that helped him through the day. Otherwise, I don't think he could have made it through that day. The king of stock car racing. It would be easy to think he's led a charmed life. And in many ways he has, but he's no stranger to hard times. When NASCAR banned the powerful Hemi engine in 1965, Richard sat out of Grand National Racing most of the year. He traded his stock car temporarily for a dragster. At a drag strip in Dallas, Georgia, his drag car flew out of control and killed a young boy in the stands. The incident led to a lawsuit that was eventually settled out of court. I could tell it, it took a lot out of him. And he sat, he would sit for hours and um, uh, in fact, one day after that, I, I found him just sitting out in the yard. And um, I knew that it was like, it was a kind of situation where you say to yourself, you know, is, th is this gonna end my career here or do I go on? I don't play on the hard times. In other words, the hard times are the ones that I forget. You know what I mean? The good times are the ones that I keep. In 1989, Richard's gas man was critically injured during a pit stop. Spilled fuel ignited when the car backfired and Robert Calicut was engulfed in flames. He suffered second and third degree burns over 30% of his body. I remember trying to get over the wall. I remember getting my feet tangled up in the windshield poles and I fell to the ground and I got back up and then uh, next time I remember somebody was putting me out with a fire extinguisher. So uh, I think it lasted about 14 seconds, but it, it seemed like 14 minutes to me. Richard and Linda supported Robert throughout his recovery, and as a result of the accident, donate the proceeds of their annual golf tournament to the North Carolina JC's Burn Center. Let me get this just right. Is he telling you how to drive? Get a, get a camera in there. Am, am I hearing this right? Get a camera in there. One of Richard's toughest emotional trials came in 1981. Dale Inman decided to leave Petty Enterprises to work for another race team. Of course, I didn't just walk up and tell Richard that it was going to happen. Me and him had talked about it. He knew he knew the reason. He knows, you know, what was going on, what had to be done, and stuff like that. And uh, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know what. I just I didn't talk about it much then. I just don't like to talk about it now. And of course, it turned out to be pretty good for me. You know what I mean? That was as bad as a death. Uh, we both went through a long uh, grieving period because um, he was part of us. I knew how bad Richard was hurting, and um, I guess I was bitter, a little bitter with Dale because I, I knew that I wanted them to be together so bad. Dale's departure was the first in a chain of events to lead to the closing of Petty Enterprises. Richard eventually left to drive for another team curb racing. After two years, he was drawn back to the family business. When he reopened the doors to Petty Enterprises, Dale was back by his side and has remained there since. A lot of people say that Dale is jealous of Richard, but, but Dale is not jealous of Richard. Dale is protective of Richard. Richard handles hard times with grace. That may have something to do with why in 1978, 40% of his stomach was removed due to ulcers. You know, he went through his bad times, went through his ulcers, went through his stomach operation, he went through the crashes, and went through the 
has been through the wrath of the press. You know, um, so many guys in the press say, well, you know, <laughs> if he won Daytona seven times and then he comes back and doesn't run right in the very front at Daytona, he ought to be, you know, he ought to be spanked. And uh, he just smiles and goes on and, and really says, I'm doing the best I can do. I'm still giving 100% effort. With just seven races to go, Richard drove into Dover, Delaware, home of the Monster Mile. This is the track where 24 years ago, he inaugurated its opening with a win, and where he took win number 199. This year, it's where he suffered his worst crash of 1992. Dick Trickle swims around, coming off the corner, hits the outside wall. Richard Petty is involved. Darrell Waltrip down to the inside. Chad Little, Michael Waltrip, Hunt Strickland, and the Dave Marcus car are here on the back straightaway, all collided. There's about nine cars up against the wall here off turn two. You know, I was racing along there right in the back of the field there, just really digging and uh, really racing with somebody. And all of a sudden, I looked up coming off the corner, and the straightaway was blocked. And I ran over three or four people, and they ran over me. And, you know, just one of those things. The crash took him out of the race, but he had no injuries. He is a lucky man when it comes to accidents. His first memorable crash came at Darlington in 1970. At Darlington, that was a bad deal. I thought he was dead at Darlington in 70 when we got in the car and had to get him out. He ended up with a dislocated shoulder and a small cut on his forehead. Ironically, he hit the exact spot of the wall where two years earlier, a plaque had been placed commemorating the day he broke his father's record of 54 victories. There was also the crash at Pocono in 1980. He broke his neck, but never missed a race. He got back in the car the following weekend wearing a custom-designed neck brace. That looks like the crash at Darlington years ago, Ned. But Richard Petty's most famous crash would have to be Daytona, 1988. Just cramming and turning over up against the wall and other cars coming in. I can remember in my mind, I pictured it like it was because the, uh, Bobby's wreck, you know, when he did it at, at Talladega, did the same thing. That's what I think, that's the only thing I could think of. If he was reckoning if it was that bad, he must be flipping and twirling like that. We asked him, we said, Daddy, what did you do while you were spinning like that? And he said that he just closed his eyes and held on for the ride. <laughs> it's gotten worse as we've got older. The danger is always there. You know, we, I know Sharon and I, when we don't go to race, races, we talk to each other on the phone. And um, we say, oh, please, just let it be a safe second. race. You know, just let everybody in the, in the race be safe. Yeah. And now, especially this being his last year, right? we just, just wanted to make it through. Yeah, we wanted him to be safe. Miraculously, he walked away from this crash, too, with little more than a broken shoulder and a bruised ankle. This in spite of flipping seven times and being soundly T-boned by Brett Bodine. Always meant to tell you, sorry about that, but I'm sure glad you got out of it okay. I'll never forget at Richmond when you come up to me and said, I asked you how you were feeling, you said, Oh, my ankle hurts a little bit. I think somebody run into me right there at the end might have bruised my ankle up. Well, we both knew who that was. This is a man with a high tolerance for pain. He doesn't even take Novocaine at the dentist. You know, your pain's like everything else. It's mind over matter, and you know you're going to hurt. The only thing you do is tell yourself you're not hurting quite as bad as what you really are. He probably raced more, uh, not sick, but not feeling like racing than most guys have when they was feeling good. He never cared. Uh, he would get in a car with a crushed rib or uh, a, a, a hip out of place or a shoulder out of place or uh, with a stomach pain. Uh, he always crawled in that race car. And he's got out of it sometimes when I didn't think he could get back in another one. But he always seemed to be there. He just always mustered that last, uh, last breath, you know, to get in that race car. I broke my ribs 15 or 20 times. I don't even know how many times. I don't know how many of them's been broke and all that. Broke my knees, uh, broke the legs, uh, fingers, shoulders, shoulder blades. You know, there's just a bunch of stuff that's been broke between here and down there. 
Next up, Martinsville, Virginia. Richard had the second win of his career at this track in 1960. Richard has won 15 times on this racetrack. That's a career for a lot of drivers. 15 victories at one racetrack. This weekend, Kyle sat on the pole, but by race end, there were no wins for the Petties. For the third time in the second half of the season, the race was affected by rain. This scene was repeated the following week in North Wilkesboro, again delaying the race to Monday. Again, no petty wins. It looked like Charlotte might make it three weeks of rain in a row. But the sun came through, and a record crowd of over 160,000 people poured into the Charlotte Motor Speedway. The Petty family was treated to a show fit for a king. With three races left, the behind-the-scenes circus was gaining steam, too. Everywhere the king goes, he's mobbed by fans and the media. Oh, look at Richard. That's good. Today's Hot New Country, 96.9 WTDR. We're talking to Richard Petty this morning. At the end of the year, I think uh, Quist is always asked, but I, we don't think anything about it. Michelle Hensley up in Rutherfordton uh, wants to know what it was like the first time you and Kyle raced against each other. I was more concerned with what Kyle was doing than what I was doing. Yeah. Uh, if anything happened on the track or there was a caution flag or something, first thing I'd done was think of, you know, where's Kyle, how's he doing, was he involved in it? And about two-thirds of the time, he was the caution flag. But, <laughs> you know. Richard has been a media darling for most of his career. He's had songs written about him. Books, countless newspaper and magazine articles, a comic book, and even a feature film based on his life called 43, The Petty Story. It was released in 1971 and starred Darren McGavin as Lee Petty and Richard in his acting debut. You really don't care. You really don't care. Sure, I care I didn't win the race. Well, I'm going to get him next time. Yeah, you want to bet there, boy. Some of the motorsports media have been on the racing circuit for so many years. If there was a chink in Richard's armor, they would have found it. I've been covering this since 58, uh, so that's uh, 34 years. And Richard Petty has never turned down an interview request from me, and I've never seen him turn one down from anyone else. A professional racing photographer since 1954, Don Hunter has documented Richard Petty's career from the beginning all the way to this year's Fan Appreciation Tour. Richard was one of the few uh, race drivers who people could have almost immediate access to. Some of the other drivers uh, weren't that easy to get to. They'd go running high. Maybe they were scared of the press or the fans. I don't know. They didn't realize how important it was at the time. Richard's always been Richard. He was a prince long before he was a king. They talked about Fireball Roberts and how important that Fireball was to changing the image of stock car racing. And indeed he was. But it was Richard who never lost that common touch, that common feel for the folks that come to all the short tracks. Married his high school sweetheart, stayed with that. And he has been one of the few superstars I've ever met whose feet were as solid in rock as the first day you met him. Richard has developed lasting ties with Tom, Don, and Ken. Earlier this year, he made time in his hectic schedule to visit a short track Ken Squire owns in Vermont. Ken said, hey, you know, you need to go back up there. There's a lot of racing fans. As I can see from here, there's a lot of racing fans here. And I, all right, I look at the press is the same way as I look at a race car driver. The press has a job to do. And they're not over there to aggravate you, they're over there to make a living. So I feel obligated to them uh, because they've got a job to do and they're helping my sport. And I try to put myself in the other people's place. For years, the press talked about the petty jinx at Charlotte 
This was never more true than when he won the world 600 in 1983. The team was fined $35,000 and his Winston Cup points forfeited when it was discovered that he was running a larger than allowed engine. A man's got to do what a man got to do. I mean, you know, you don't, you can sit back and uh, you see things happening. So, uh, you know, you just got to get competitive. And, you know, we got competitive and we got caught. He was there. He faced the questions and uh, faced the deal and explained his side of it, that he wasn't aware that the engine was a little bit large. And uh, uh, he, he came through it. Uh, he didn't lose a single fan. This year, the whole Petty clan watched as Richard made his final run at Charlotte, and as Kyle worked his way to the front of the pack. And here comes Kyle Petty in the Felix Savetas, car number 42, the Mellow Yellow car, down on the inside. What a charge. Kyle led most of the race and went on to finish third. Richard finished in 27th. He wasn't even worth seeing, right? No, he's driving it great today. Car was wrong, man. Among the petty guests at Charlotte was North Carolina Governor Jim Martin, evidence of Richard Petty's deep commitment to his political beliefs. I'm a very conservative Republican. Uh, in fact, I might be ultra conservative from time to time on step. Yeah, I'm, I'm a strong believer in individual rights and in individual people doing what they want to do, uh, working your own way. Uh, you don't. The government don't pay you nothing unless you work for it. Uh, I, I believe everybody here in his own loop. The Petties are politically active as well. Richard has served as a county commissioner for Randolph County since 1978, and Linda has been a school board member for eight years. She ran again this year and won. Their service to the community hasn't gone unnoticed. In October, Randleman dedicated a statue on Main Street to their hometown hero. There's so many facets to him. Uh, in so many different areas, whether it be Richard Petty, the county commissioner, Richard Petty, the race car driver, Richard Petty, the goodwill ambassador for the sport. I'd like for more people to know what he's done for people outside of racing, uh, the people that come in here in wheelchairs, uh, the make-a-wish kids, the blind kids, the kids that are burnt real bad. We've had, uh, we've had terminally ill kids to come in, we'd put them in the race car and set them down, let him talk to them. And just to make that one special day for him, that means, that means a lot to me. From the beginning of his career, Richard has donated at least 10% of his annual income to charity. The Bible tells us we're supposed to, to give a tenth of what we take in. And I feel that every time that I've ever shared my money with other people, I've been paid back double. And so maybe it's a greedy part of it, but it really makes you feel good. It makes me feel good to see other people feel good. He's just a great person. You know, him and Linda both, they, uh, it's so unbelievable how they are. You think, you know, when you lay down at night, you say, are these people real? You know, they're just uh, everything. If you got a kid, you'd want them to be just like him because, I mean, they're so honest and uh, humble. The everyday values of the Petties are reflected in their lifestyle, unpretentious and down to earth. People have said for years that all Richard Petty cares about is driving race cars. <laughs> Tell that to a man who'd like nothing better than to go to the moon. If they call me up tomorrow, I'd be gone the day after to, just to go do it. I, I think it would be uh, the ultimate adventure. Uh, you know, where you say, going where no man's ever gone before. Richard has a multitude of interests. He and Linda are collectors. She collects dolls. He, all kinds of things. He still has a pair of boots in his closet that he wore when he was a junior in high school. He's got about 500 pocket watches, hundreds of belt buckles, over 100 uh, uh, firearms, collector's items. Richard is also well-versed in United States history, especially the Civil War, and he loves to read but no fiction, thank you. Even though I've read some Richard Petty books and stuff, sometimes I think it's kind of fictional, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I look at, again, if I'm going to read, I, I want it to be constructive end of the deal.
One of Richard Petty's favorite ways to wind down is to hop on one of his all-terrain vehicles and tear off down the many trails he's carved on his property. He's not a practical joker, but he and his family know how to have a good time. He wasn't at our piano recitals. He wasn't at our dance recitals, our graduation. But when he was home, he was home. Yeah, totally. You know, he came in, we jumped on him. He would, you know, roll on the floor with us. And um, it was quality time. Might not have been quantity time, but quality time. Richard Petty, husband, father, politician, historian, collector, adventurer, and businessman. Probably a lot of people would be surprised at how knowledgeable he is about business affairs. But he is very, very shrewd about business. He really know, knows what he's doing. Richard owns Petty Enterprises and the Richard Petty Museum. It's home to Lee's and Richard's trophies, gifts from fans, awards, and honors. Now in its fifth year, the museum has over 20,000 visitors annually. Richard also sponsors a driving school called NASTRAC. All that in addition to a full-time show car that travels the country and two souvenir trucks that go to the races. All of this and all the buttons and all the C6 decals for $12. Richard's family usually makes the trek to Rockingham, and this year is no exception. It's close to home, and Richard and Kyle run well here. That car is really hooked up today. There was one story to today's race at The Rock, Kyle Petty. Kyle Petty has this one in hand, looking for his sixth career victory, his fourth on a super speedway. Kyle Petty, for the third time, breaks the bank at Rockingham. This win was for you, Dad. From the rock, time to head them up and move them out west to Arizona. On the only southwestern stop of the tour, it was petty mania as usual. Richard was the Grand Marshal. Gentlemen, start your engine. Phoenix fans got what they came for. One last chance to see the king and to bid him well on his way to Atlanta. Richard Petty is one race away from the conclusion of his driving career. And what a career it has been. It would be impossible to pick any single moment as Richard's most glorious. But 1967, was definitely his year. Richard Petty and his big blue number 43 made a shambles of the stock car record books in 1967, winning almost everything in sight. Petty started 48 races in the 1967 season. He won 27 of them. No other NASCAR race driver ever won more than 18 races in a single year before. During August, September, and October of 1967, Richard Petty smashed another record. He entered and took first place in 10 races in a row. Me and him, talk, we've talked a whole lot about this, and even back, you know, he, we went one stretch there and won 10 races in a row, you know what I mean? And uh, that was a big deal at that time because I knew somewhere along the line we was going to lose one, you know what I mean? We finally lost a race at Charlotte. But uh, I don't think we ever bragged on Richard driving or just, he was just supposed to do it, you know what I mean? We were supposed to keep the car under him and uh, I don't think he ever bragged on us and we never bragged on him and it, uh, that's just the way it happened. He had that magic touch of being able to uh, just uh, like uh, uh, handle a car like his on velvet carpet. Uh, he just seemed in invincible in that period of time. The only year to compare to 1967 would be 1992. This, too, has been the year of Richard Petty. 
And this year, uh, three of us keeping a calendar was an interesting and challenging situation, but it, it, was, uh, it was a team effort, really. I mean, the, all my job was to be the coordinator and coordinate and put everybody together to make it all mix and work well, and it was a great team effort from everybody. You never imagined that you need security guards, you need extra help, you need extra people to help him get to where he's going. And he can't walk across a garage area, inside a garage, and it takes a half hour. When Richard crosses the finish line in Atlanta, he'll close one door only to open another as Richard Petty, car owner. It's still going to be fun. He, he's always told me it was we were having fun. So uh, we're still going to be having fun. In the driver's seat of the new STP number 44, Rick Wilson. It still hadn't sunk in, and right to this day it hadn't sunk in real tight, you know. I reckon when we crawl in there at Daytona in February and fire the engines, I'll know for sure then it's real, and then I'm going to pinch myself then. <laughs> He's very excited about running for Richard Petty and running to STP Colors, and we're very excited about what's going to be happening next year, and so is Richard. On the eve of Richard's last race, Atlanta's Georgia Dome was gearing up for the ultimate petty party. Live from the Georgia Dome, Alabama salutes Richard Petty. Alabama and 55,000 friends. I know he'll drive forever. Country music, stock car racing, and a sold out crowd of petty fans came together to pay tribute to one of America's last living legends. And he will be remembered as the best that's ever been. I've been a Petty fan since 1962, so we're here. We wouldn't miss this for the world. He's meant a lot to me over the years, and I'm going to hate to see him get out of the car. Through thick and thin, whether he's one or not, he's my man. I ain't much on shedding tears, but I, there'd be a lot of tears shed down there probably when he climbs out of that car. I'll probably hug his neck and kiss him too. <laughs> probably will. Hey, I really appreciate all, all of what y'all are doing with us and stuff over the years. And don't try not to hit me today, I'll try not to hit you. <laughs> I'm probably more emotional about it today than Richard is. Uh, I think that the impact has fully not set in with him. <laughs> you made me gray-headed, Richard, back, don't you? 35 years ago, Richard Petty climbed in a race car for the first time. Today, 600,000 miles and 8,000 pit stops later, he climbs in for the last time. You know, you're going to be sad because it's, you know it's going to be your last race. You're going to be happy because you know it is your last race. So I'm going to have a lot of mixed emotions, and I think my family's going to have a lot of mixed emotions. I think that I would like to, to say to him, God bless you, man. You have been a great individual, a great race driver, and thank you for all that you've done for our sport. Then I would just say thank you uh, for, for teaching me how to drive, for all you've meant to me, um, for teaching me how to treat fans, uh, for everything you've ever done. Uh, you know, everything I learned that I learned from Richard Petty. The coat that I'm wearing today, my father-in-law gave my mother-in-law in high school when they met. And since she's my hero, I wore it today in honor of her. Daddy, start your engine! Thousands of orange and white balloons go skyward while four Apache helicopters hover overhead the Atlanta Motor Speedway. It is a festive atmosphere for the season finale in the Winston Cup Series 1992. Come on, King! Woo! Come on, Richard! The crowd 
rises to its feet, salutes the field as it comes down. The green flag waves and the Hooters 500 is underway. Inside, I think the truth be known, there's a little sadness to it. When he's in the car by himself today and buckles up, there's no reporters asking questions, no cameras in his face. I think Richard will probably have a little thought in his mind about this is my life's, life's ride. This race will have a winner, determine a Winston Cup champion, and bring to a close the glorious driving career of Richard Petty. That would be drama enough, but as always with racing, nothing's predictable. Oh, crash! Big Down the front straightaway. Ken Schrader, Wally Dollin back, Darrell Walters involved, and Richard Petty is flaming going into turn number one. He's knocked the oil cooler off his car, and the oil is on fire. Richard Petty, the car is on fire. Yeah, they got there. I pulled up to the fire truck. As they go down the straightaway, other cars start going in the crash. There's Darrell Walter spinning. Dallenbach hits him. Bickle's in the mix. And Darrell and Richard Petty runs into Darrell Walter, knocks the oil cooler off his car. The oil goes back on the exhaust system. And there's where the fire came from. There is the king out of the car. He's all right? Yeah, he's fine. He's OK. He got out and waved to the ground over there, OK? Going away to the end of that. Much to the relief of his family and his fans, Richard wasn't injured in the crash. It was wasn't the kind of blaze of glory I wanted to go out in, but uh, the main, main thing is nobody got hurt in the wreck, and I've spent 35 years doing this, and I'm still walking around talking, so uh, the good Lord looked after me for a long time. We're going to try to put it back together when it throws the white flag. We ain't no front paper. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Daddy. Hi, the Petty crew wasted no time in getting the car back together. They were determined to get their driver out for one last chance to take the checkered flag. There were three winners today. Race winner Bill Elliott, Winston Cup champion Alan Kowicki, and Richard Petty. Direct your attention up to turn four, ladies and gentlemen, where for the final time, the legend, the man, the king, Richard Petty, will say goodbye to all the millions of fans who have adored him for many, many years. So on your feet, wave and say goodbye, your special way to King Richard Petty. Every time this superstar wins a race, he sets a new all-time record. Richard Petty has won his sixth Daytona 500, and the crowd here are going absolutely mad. But to me, he's just Richard, you know what I mean? He's just, he's just no more than he was when he rode the bicycles with us and when we went uh, swimming in Polecat Creeks and all that. That's that's all he is to me right now. And, uh, you know, I love the guy to death. Richard Petty has won the 200th race of his incomparable Grand National Stock Car Racing career. Whatever happens in the end, if I didn't work for him tomorrow, I'd have to say thank you. If he called me up at 3 in the morning and wanted to go pick potatoes, I'd ask him what time the truck was going to be there. And there's no other person I can think of to be better qualified to be a hero than Richard Petty. This is the last time the STP number 43 will make its way around a racetrack. Words from the Wizard of Oz come to mind. A heart is not judged by how much you love, but by how much you are loved by others. And that, my sentimental friends, is Richard Petty.
much that I have done. I live my share of tragedy. 